Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. Today we're here to do it. The first quarterback prospect profile of the 2024 NFL draft season. And you know what, Nick? It's the first quarterback prospect profile that we've ever done on this show. And crazy. Which is crazy. And judging by the bags under my eyes, I don't know if you could see them from this view, probably, and the bags under your eyes that I can see, which, no, not a negative. Don't worry. It just means it's draft season, and we're watching tape late. We're doing stuff late, and we're not getting that much sleep. And I know you've been watching a lot of J.J. McCarthy film to prepare yourself for this podcast, Nick. So I'm excited to get your takeaways. I did a lot of my J.J. work earlier, maybe two, one and a half, two weeks ago, but then I went back and watched a little bit more to prepare myself for this podcast, went back to my notes, looked at some things. So I'm really excited to talk about our first quarterback that we've ever done as a prospect. Um, we will once again be showing a little bit of, um, I don't want to say the word in case they're you know, filtering by that, Nick, but what you guys will see some stuff today on that from a, from a football standpoint, hopefully it will, it will, it will be allowed, uh, not by us, but those who know, no, but I want to start here, Nick, before we get into any of the discussion about JJ, I want to just discuss like some overview stuff, some 30,000 foot view stuff with JJ with the quarterback position. And I want to start, start specifically with JJ McCarthy because his prospect rise among the let's call it media right now, because we don't know true NFL draft boards. Let's say his rise right now from the end of the football season to now among the media has been kind of crazy, right? Like he was viewed as potential early second round pick, maybe a second rounder, then late first, you trade back into the first now top 10, maybe top five, maybe three overall, maybe four overall. Here's some of the things we're hearing about him. And I think, among all the quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, and Michael Penix, the most buzz and the most, you know, reporting, quote unquote, has been done about McCarthy, which I find really interesting. So here's just some things that have happened in, like, I gathered just from the last three days, Nick. Former Vikings general manager Rick Spielman believes the Vikings will overpay to move up to get J.J. McCarthy. He suggests the Vikings will trade 11, 23, a future first, and more. Per ESPN's, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that's a lot. There, and more. more. I know. I have more. Beautiful. Per ESPN's Matt Miller, enough sources around the NFL are whispering that McCarthy could very well be the second quarterback off the board. And this is not the first time that I've heard the Reds, uh, the, sorry, the commanders linked to McCarthy, that some execs in the commander's room believe he's the quarterback too. Another one here, Jordan Ronan from 4-7. That's two days ago. The Giants have a lot of interest in McCarthy if he's available at six overall. Another one today from Paul Schwartz, who is, in my opinion, probably besides Ralph Vacchiano, the most connected to the actual like Mara family, like those source. Like when I hear Vacchiano and Schwartz, I feel like there's like a little bit of a difference in the reporting to me, at least those two Vacchiano and Schwartz. They've been with the beat for a while. And I think there's some kind of connection to the old members of, of the Giants ownership. It's just my take on that. You don't have to agree or disagree with that. Anyone listening. But Paul Schwartz today says if someone in the know told, told me or no, sorry, Paul Schwartz, they said that in his mock draft, he mocked J.J. McCarthy, the Giants at six. And also said the Giants are very interested in McCarthy at six. I've also heard, Nick, that the Giants are very interested in McCarthy at six. I'm not going to share with who, from who or what. I get too, into too much details of that. But I know the Giants are very interested in McCarthy. They've had a private visit for McCarthy, a top 30 visit, a private workout. They've taken him out to dinner, Nick. They've done a lot. They've spent a lot of resources on J.J. McCarthy. Um, and then there's just a few other things that I've seen reported. I'm sure you've seen them as well, Nick. Um uh, I went to the Matt Miller one, but Albert Breer was discussing that he could be going higher than people expect in the top five. Uh, he said, my sense is the Patriots haven't made their mind up, but they're interested in J.J. McCarthy. So we got that. McCarthy has odds to go to the Vikings. That's the team most likely to draft him, according to the betting scales, Nick, at plus 100. That's not a huge favorite, but it is, you know, the favorite right now. And then finally, I'm waiting for this one report from the guy I found from uh, who's connected to the Patriots. I'm trying to find it right now. Yes, it was Michael S. Holly who said, there's a really good chance J.J. McCarthy could wind up on the New England Patriots. And they have the third pick. The Washington Commanders are the second pick. The Giants have the sixth pick. So that's a lot right there, Nick. Any thoughts on just the crazy amount of pre-draft buzz and the Giants connections to him and everything like that? I'm not surprised by the pre-draft buzz. I think a lot of people formulated their opinions around J.J. McCarthy because he was in such a good system, because he had... A, a rushing attack, a rushing base system that was predicated off the play action and because his stats weren't all that great. So people mm -hmm. looked at him and they were just like, this is just like a system type of guy. But if you do 
parse through the tape, and if you do watch the tape, you see some advanced level quarterbacking from JJ McCarthy. Now, on the last podcast we did, or maybe it was two podcasts ago, I expressed my um, reservations with JJ McCarthy, and those reservations still remain. And we'll get into some of those reservations throughout this throughout this discussion. I did cut up a lot of his highlights, so the plays that you're going to be seeing, they're his highlights. They're not. Some of his, I don't think I have any negative plays in there. There, there might be some of the tail end. I'm not 100% certain, but they are their highlights. There, there, there is portions of JJ's game, though, specifically deep passing, touch over the middle of the field that are problematic. But when I turn on his tape, I liked him a lot more than I feel like a lot of people portrayed him as. But it did seem like people were pointing at people who were stating that JJ McCarthy was a was was a good quarterback as if they were crazy or something. Like that's what I, that's at least my interpretation of the overall draft community, draft X, draft Twitter, whatever you whatever the hell you want to say. And when I turn on the tape, and maybe it was just cuz I watched the ECU game to start, yeah. I was like, "Yo, this guy is ripping the football on sale concepts outside the numbers, perfect ball placement on that one touchdown to Roman Wilson." And you know what? As I bring it up, since it's like eight minutes of highlights right here, let me just run through the plays so those on YouTube can enjoy all the plays that we are uh, talking about. But yeah, man, no, I uh, I ended up coming away liking his tape more than I expected, but I don't know if I am sold on, on the Giants selecting him at six because I don't know what that ceiling is. I think if he does land with a team like Kevin O'Connell, you brought up the Minnesota Vikings, I think he would operate very well in that quick rhythmic passing attack. And I'll go through some of that a little bit later as I get into my synopsis and things of that nature. Yeah, well, that what you just said, Nick, and we're going to get into all of this, but what you just said basically, you know, touches on the 30,000 foot view debate about this, about taking a quarterback at number six overall. When you take a quarterback at number six overall, what are you looking for? I think Nick and I have a very, I would say you and I, Nick, have a pretty aligned feel. It's the play I was talking about, by the way. Like, watch this. Sorry to cut you off, but no, far hash, high. Yeah, that's, oh, that's God. Legit. Away from the defender, high, so the receiver can catch it away from his frame, far hash. When he's thrown to his right, man, he has some really, really good throws. Like That's beautiful. That's, that's a beautiful pass right there by yeah. J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, you want to get that up and over the defender's arms. There's not not really not a better place to put that football. Um, and I really do feel like, and we'll get into some of the pros and cons soon, but uh, but. I really do feel like he throws great throwing to his right. It's to his left where I have some concerns. And even to his right, there are some moments where I feel like from clean pockets, he overstrides into some of his throws and just overshoots of Alabama out the pass out pass against Alabama is one that, that crucially stands in my mind. Um, but talking about it from a 30,000 view, I think what I was trying to say, Nick was me and you are aligned in the sense of, we probably view drafting a quarterback a little bit differently than others. And, you know, a lot of our peers, do believe that when you're in a position like the Giants are in right now, where, where quite frankly, I know, you know this is up for some debate, I guess, but they've had really poor quarterback play for five straight years. There were some moments in 2022 that were pretty good overall. I wouldn't necessarily say they were great from a passing standpoint, but they were fine quarterback play in the moment. It was good. The schedule was was favorable and it is what it is. But as a full five year sample size, Nick, we've had we've had pretty poor quarterback play for the giants for a little while. Of course, the factors, the battle line, the receivers, all of that stuff, changing coordinators. But when we view us taking a quarterback at six or we're not just looking at it. Like here's the giant step chart. Here's what they don't have at quarterback right now. We need to get a quarterback in here, no matter what, because building pieces around him, putting a receiver out there, putting an O line men out there is not going to help until they get the quarterback. Because for us, it's not really about finding a top 15, a top 20, even really, an outside the top 10 quarterback in the NFL. For us, it's about finding somebody who could project to be a top five quarterback in the NFL and can also project to win you football games and win you divisions on a consistent basis and maybe compete for Super Bowls on a consistent basis after he gets that second contract. And after you're allocating the 50, 60, 70, whatever it will eventually be, million dollars of your cap space to that one player in that one position. So I think that's going to kind of shape and frame where we want, who we want the Giants to take, and whether we're ultimately we will decide on on a quarterback, Nick, or whoever is on the board there. But do you kind of, what are, what are kind of your thoughts on that? I agree with you. I think it also depends on the context of the team that you have around the player. Because I think a team that has an infrastructure in place that is at least almost ready to compete for championships brings in a guy like J.J. McCarthy, and then you can continue to add more expensive pieces to that team with the quarterback on the rookie contract. I think J.J. McCarthy at least has the ability to to lead a franchise. And I'm not sure, certain if the Giants are quite there. I, I'm willing to hear an argument, though, Dan, that, that they might be. You know, you just invested in Brian Burns. You have Dexter Lawrence. You have Andrew Thomas. 
the highlights that I'm running through right now, you can see what I'm talking about, the allure of J.J. McCarthy. And I want to get into my synopsis so people really understand how I feel about J.J. McCarthy. But what is being lost in this conversation is, oh, man, that's so beautiful, too, man. Just, that, that throws outside, but it just is away from, from this defender. It's against the outside to throw it away from the defender. Yep. That's my point. Yeah. So watch. He beats it right there. Like These types of throws over the middle of the field, I absolutely love by J.J. McCarthy. But what is being lost is how well he is interviewing. And that's something that we've heard all across the NFL. So many teams are falling in love with this kid in the interview room. And then you look at his past. He won a national championship at Michigan. He's undefeated against Ohio State when Jim Harbaugh was being talked about as possibly getting fired a few years ago because he couldn't get over the hump against Ohio State. And then if you go back to his time in college, when he was at, or I mean, at high school, when he was at Nazareth, won a state championship, went to a state championship twice. That's Nazareth High School in Illinois. And then COVID-19 happens and Illinois shut down. So he couldn't play. I think it was his senior or maybe his junior year. So he transfers. I think it was his senior year. He transfers to IMG Academy. We all know IMG Academy. That is in Florida, Bradenton, Florida. That's where Evan Neal went. It's a, it's a factory. What does he do? Wins a national championship. So he's won at every level of playing football, at high level playing football, at the high school level, twice, two different stops. And then he also won in college. And that shouldn't shock us that the NFL is falling in love with that. And I'm imagining he's also saying the right things in these interview rooms. Uh, what do you have on that? And then I'll get into the synopsis. No, I think it's important. I want to, I want to keep, we can get into synopsis. I want to talk a little bit though, about like the idea of what we think maybe the ceiling is, but we can get to that later. That's fine. But I, I do think that's important because just to give you the, the further stats on that, he's, he's gone 60 and four, 60 wins and four losses as a starter in high school in the collegiate level. JJ McCarthy he was 33 and three in high school. Like you said, he won the class seven, a 2018 state, uh, state title as a sophomore and Naz Nazareth Academy in Illinois. And then, like you said, 2020, he won the national title as a senior at IMG. Academy. Then in college, he was 27 and one as a starter, including the national championship win um, last year and almost won a national championship the year before. And guess what? You may not think that's important, those listening, and I'm not sure if you do or don't, but I can tell you people who do NFL coaches, NFL evaluators, and NFL, NFL scouts do believe in the importance of winning football games. Bill Parcells was a big believer in starting football games at the college level against power five teams and winning football games, winning wins at the collegiate level are still now some people, again, Nick have made the case. We need to devalue them or we need to take start putting, uh, stop putting so much credence on them. But a lot of, a lot of people in the NFL who are making these decisions still believe it's a really important factor. And absolutely is a really important factor. And it can be enhanced when you actually watch the tape and he's making throws like this up the seam, right in between yep. a safety and right over the top of a linebacker. Now, this is a type of throw that I need to see more of, but it's in his arsenal, right? Because it's like we've said uh, on previous podcasts, he is kind of a one speed thrower and, and could do a better job putting touch and trajectory underneath some of his footballs. But this one, he does that. It's over the linebacker. It's nice and high. And this tight end they have is, is a very good football player, Loveland as well. So, yeah, the winning is, is certainly has to be factored in. And that's also, like I said a little bit earlier, they're talking about, oh, wow, he's great in the meeting rooms. He's amazing in the meeting rooms. Well, he's a winner. He gets it from that standpoint. He's probably very coachable, probably did really well on the whiteboard. It's no wonder right. that NFL teams are looking at this kid who just turned 21 years old and has all this winning on his resume and these high-level throws that you're watching right now on YouTube and thinks, hey, we can turn this kid into into something special and maybe get a ceiling that hasn't necessarily been actualized yet. Yeah, and I think part of that is that JJ McCarthy is a, is a player who really hasn't it's it's just similar he's to the Drake too. May. He's well, he's an incredibly too. tough player. If, if we're going to get into that, he played hockey at the at the high school level and I think that plays a big factor in his toughness, but if we're getting into some of what you're discussing Part of what I like about him, and this is part of what I like about prospects like him and Drake May, who are young on the younger side, is they haven't started that many games at the collegiate level, and they're still young in their processing. Like, if you just watch some of the moments from JJ, you'll see, if you watch his film, you'll see moments where his processing, in my opinion, is great and shows elite glimpses, Nick. And then you'll see moments where I feel like he's late on throws or he's late with his processing. And that, to me, is a good sign, not a bad sign, because that, to me, tells me that he's still learning to play this position, and he's processing, and he's having those moments that the coaches want him to have, but he hasn't played quarterback for six years like Michael Penix or Bo Nick. So he's not just full mastery of the system that he's running. And 
despite that, to have the moments like you've seen where he's making those throws over the middle of the field. And he uses the middle of the field better than any quarterback in this class besides maybe Drake May and Caleb Williams, in my opinion, and has the upside and projection, in my opinion, to use the middle of the field better than anyone in this class besides those three. And I really do believe that because I'm not a big believer that people who don't use the middle of the field in college, like Penix and Jaden Daniels, are just going to magically be great in the middle of the field of the NFL. I mean, it's possible, but you know who else didn't use the middle of the field in college and he was bottom nine in it, Nick? Daniel Jones and Daniel Jones struggles, struggles, in my opinion, with using the middle of the field in the intermediate range. He throws a pretty good ball there. He just doesn't really see it a lot. So I think the moments from J.J. McCarthy that have people excited from the intermediate throws, the throws over the right side, the NFL caliber reads and processing. To me, one of his best traits, Nick, is just how I'm trying to see if how I could frame this. To me, one of his best traits, I'm curious if you see this too when you watch him, is how connected he is as a quarterback. So this may sound like nonsense to you. And I, and, and I always bring back this joke, Nick, because there's this guy, when you, when you get super into golf, Nick, what the first thing you do when you're really into golf is you start following a million, probably like, I don't know, not a million, like a hundred Instagram accounts of golf, pe golf pros and golf teachers trying to teach you the game, Nick. And there's this one guy who tries to teach the game. And essentially all he really does, in my opinion, in his videos is show you a, a swing of him hitting the ball, like 300 yards or hitting Chris, a crisp iron, then being, and to just say, stay connected. His whole thing is the connected golfer. And he's not totally wrong in his analysis that if you stay connected throughout your swing, you're going to hit the ball well, and you're going to have a good swing. But it doesn't really teach you how to do it. But I do feel like from a quarterback standpoint, Nick, from a mechanical standpoint, when you have that lower half and that upper half connected as a thrower, it does really make a big difference in if you can stay on target and if you can throw the ball with velocity and good and all those things that we want, timing and anticipation. Do you feel like when you watch McCarthy, he has a really he does a really good job of having those lower body and upper body mechanics connected? Yeah, of course. He's very mechanically sound. And Which if is the ball comes expected. out of his hand. It zips out of his hand. Why? Why would that not be expected, though? Because I think he's viewed and billed as a as more of a toolsy prospect with a more of a projection player. I don't know, man. I mean, this is somebody who comes from a pro style offense. Harbaugh put a lot on this kid's plate at a very young age, setting protections and all of that. And if you just watching on YouTube, man, his footwork. Watch JJ McCarthy's footwork and how he handles the pocket, and then go watch Drake May. Right. And I'm not right. saying that I like JJ McCarthy better than Drake May, but McCarthy is so much more crisp and precise with his feet and everything is boom, boom, boom on time and within rhythm. And that doesn't mean he can't extend play plays and improvise. You've seen a bunch of very well improvised plays throughout this YouTube. If you're on it so yeah. far, and I actually think he's pretty creative as a thrower and doesn't necessarily get the uh, recognition for doing so that, uh, that I believe he has shown throughout his 2023 season. Now that could be another reason why some people are, are, hesitant with J.J. McCarthy because he only has this one year because in 2022, his tape was not nearly as crisp as this, but it all clicked this season. And yes, he had a very good team, but just watch him from a mechanics uh, standpoint. Yeah, he has this wide base, wide, strong base. I think he's stronger in the pocket than he gets credit for because he is a little bit thin framed, which I don't love, but I also seen him shed tackles in the pocket. But yeah, from a mechanical standpoint, to your point, it's it's dialed in. I personally feel like his his mechanics from not not down to supper mechanics, the full fit deal, like the lower half and the upper half are as connected and as impressive to me for what I'm looking for as anyone in this class, but Caleb Williams. I do really believe that. And that, that's, that goes Jaden Daniels, uh, panics, and obviously Drake May, who needs to work on that type of thing. But I just feel like watching him throw and watching him move, maneuver in the pocket it's, it's, it's up there for me. And I really like to watch that. That's something that's really stood out to me with, with um, uh, JJ McCarthy. Absolutely. Now I'm going to get into this uh, not so synopsis synopsis. And we'll get back into this stuff just because I want people to understand how I actually think about this player. All right. Ready? Yep. JJ McCarthy experienced a massive jump in his play from the 2022 season, which helped the Michigan Wolverines win their 12th national championship. McCarthy earned the trust of Michigan's coaching staff and handled pro styled concepts and pre-snap checks that suggest a wide mental bandwidth and a precocious ability to process the complexities of the quarterback position. 
He's mechanically sound in the pocket with clean footwork on his drop back and the ability to operate a quick rhythmic passing attack successfully. McCarthy manages the pocket well with a good sense of pressure and how and when to step up or evade. He also does a good job extending plays, keeping his eyes downfield and setting an example of toughness and leadership that the rest of the Wolverines attempted to emulate throughout their championship campaign. He's a wide base thrower who gets good torque through his lower half into his throws. He also does well changing his arm slot when on the move and he is creative as a playmaker and thrower when escaping the pocket football fires out of McCarthy's hand with extreme velocity he clocked in with the second fastest throw at the 2024 NFL scouting combine a speed of 61 miles per hour that is no doubt impressive and was on full display in high leverage situations throughout the season however McCarthy's inability to develop a changeup or consistently alter the trajectory of certain passes remains a concern he's not an inaccurate quarterback but his accuracy can be inconsistent and it can be erratic at times albeit He'll precisely rip far hash throws to the sideline on the outside shoulder of wide receivers. I have concerns over McCarthy's deep passing ability. His 2023 49% completion rate beyond 20 yards isn't tragically bad, but the blatant misses on deep passes are problematic. He needs to do a better job putting more air underneath the football to allow his wide receivers to run underneath certain passes. He is more comfortable throwing to his right but I don't believe he is terrible at throwing to his left. He flashes good anticipatory throwing over the middle of the field and on far hash comeback curl routes outside the numbers. It's not consistently present and he can be a bit late with the football at times, but overall he sees the field well with good awareness and responds well to the defense's intentions. All right, I got two more, Rick. He is more than just a developmental quarterback prospect with enticing athletic traits. McCarthy has to improve his touch and deep ball accuracy to be successful in the NFL. He does not have top 15 arm talent, but possesses a fastball that would strike Ken Griffey Jr. out in his prime. Can he develop the changeup or the splitter? Can he improve his arm talent and deep accuracy? These are questions that every coach will ponder. For now, he could operate well in the right system. Focusing on the Giants, Brian Dable's offense with Daniel Jones fits well with McCarthy's skill set. However, the selection of a quarterback in the top six should transcend the Dable offense we've witnessed over the last two seasons. I'm not saying it wouldn't be an improvement, but some of the inconsistencies about the offense wouldn't be readily fixed with McCarthy added to the room. However, it's plausible he can continue to develop and reach a new level of quarterbacking. I think that's very fair the, in its total analysis. The only take that I would maybe disagree on personally would be that I don't I don't love the fit for Brian Dable's offense. Now, I think Brian Dable's offense will change with a player like McCarthy, but I really do think he, if he goes to a McVay Shanahan principal offense, it's the best fit for his skill set. That's the to best me, fit, but that doesn't mean Dable's offense yeah, is bad. Sure. Daniel Jones sure. has operated in Dable's offense now. It hasn't been great, but it was good in 2022. True. My reason for saying that is JJ McCarthy is a controlled athlete on the run. He's right. coordinated. He's balanced. Right. The play action bootleg has been a primary source of generating yardage in in uh, Brian Dable's offense and focusing on middle of the field play action throws is something I think JJ McCarthy would be an upgrade over Daniel Jones. I think he would For operate sure. well, really well in Dable's offense. It doesn't mean it would be his best fit though. Yeah, I, I I would think that's possibly true. I mean, depends what kind of offense they're running. If they're running the 2022 version, yeah. If they're running yeah. like what Tyrod ran, I'm not sure. But he could obviously get into that. He could he can evolve as a quarterback. That's not to say he's not he yeah. is what he is right now. Like this, he's 21 years old. But something that I thought you brought up that was interesting to me was the athleticism because I don't really think people realize quite like okay like. There's the hand timed Michael Penix four five eight forty yard dash that when you watch the tape you're just like okay then why did he scramble eleven times total in a full season when he plays like seventeen games because in the playoffs and like where's the speed on tape? Barthy was in the ninety second percentile among all quarterbacks when it comes to the three cone testing with the six eight two three cone which is absurd it shows an absurd ability to change direction and lateral agility and these are evident on his tape when you watch him when he's scrambling to to his right to throw the football which by the way when he's on the move scrambling to his right he does it better than a lot of these quarterbacks in this class as far as keeping his eyes downfield and understanding where the space is and where the open receivers are going to be and that's something i like about him but it's also when he's in the open field as a runner like he he has they use him on some some design runs nick and he's not a bad runner in my opinion i don't think he's going to be like an all-star Lamar Jackson type, obviously, but he can move in the open field and he's tough, like you said, at picking up that yardage. So I think you're right and you're onto something where he has better than advertised athleticism. He absolutely has better than advertised athleticism. I'm wondering why he didn't test at the combine with like the 40 yard dash. Maybe uh -huh. he didn't think, maybe he didn't prepare for it. He didn't think he would actually get uh, too fast of a, um, a run. Now he's not Jane Daniels out there from a straight line perspective, but he's plenty fast. And I just think he's a fluid athlete, man. Like I said a little earlier, balanced and coordinated. 
I think the way he throws a football has a level of creativity, like I said earlier, that he does not get credit for. And that's something that he should get credit for. It's it's that imp- ability to improvise and, and and change your arm angle and throw through these awkward windows that you don't see every quarterback do because he can throw off platform. I've seen yes. people who I respect say, oh, yeah, he's not good at throwing off platform. I think he's fine throwing off platform. So that's something that I that I noticed. Again, like my main concerns are the ones I brought up in the synopsis, man. It's. He's not consistent throwing a deep ball and he doesn't, he just has like a really good fastball over the middle of the field. A lot of his interceptions were to that underneath defender. It was a defender just sitting underneath. And if you put a little bit more touch on the football, it wouldn't have been intercepted, but he just kind of zips it in there. And he does that way too consistently. He needs to, he needs to develop, as I said, a splitter, a curveball, and, and different types of throws to upgrade his arm talent because he has velocity. He has velocity in spades. He has arm strength. He's not, he has a stronger arm than Jaden Daniels, for instance. He just, doesn't have necessarily the best arm talent because he needs to vary the trajectory of his passes, depending on the coverage that's in front of him. And that's a big factor there. And the difference between arm talent and arm strength, which is something people always ask us about. And we, we try to break down Nick, I'm going to get into a little bit of my scouting report on him. Cause I did a profile for uh, CBS sports and we can talk about anything you, you see, or you don't see from that. So I'm going to start with the strengths for me. I said, McCarthy has a concise and compact delivery of the football, no long windup and little wasted movement. That's important to me. The quarterbacks yeah. with those long windups, man, Byron left, which comes to mind is like the classic example. It is very hard to win in the NFL with a windup. The fact that he has the delivery already as concise as he has it will let him get rid of the football quick. I said his footwork and upper body stay well connected, which we talked about. I said he showed advanced traits from a development standpoint, such as how he operates the play action passing game. Something I noticed on film with McCarthy, Nick, is when he's operating play action passing, he gets his body, he gets his head snapped around fast and his body and feet squared. And it looks a lot like a veteran NFL quarterback on play action as far as getting that body turned around. And that's something that seems so minute. But I remember Greg Cassell talking about it two, three years ago um, when he was breaking down Daniel Jones's tape. That's something Daniel Jones did really well as a rookie with the Giants. Um, and it's just that ability off play action to get your body well situated to get rid of the football. Because, you know, a lot of the time on play action, Nick, you're not going to have a lot of time to get rid of the football. So you got to have that. I said he's not afraid to make tight window throws that require velocity and timing. The ones I like to refer to as Sunday throws because they're the windows that are only available at the collegiate level that I mean, I'm saying that aren't only available at the collegiate level. And that's goes to what you were discussing about using the middle of the field. I said, I thought from what I saw, Nick, he, and this, this is compared to the rest of the class. I thought he showed excellent poise when making, uh, making throws from the pocket under pressure. He's not afraid to make a throw. Even when he knows the follow through will result in him getting hit by the defender. And there's a lot of examples of that. And that's another real trait. I really, really like, I said, he throws with better ball placement throwing to his right. He also throws, this was the weird part to me. I feel like he throws with more velocity when throwing to his right. That's a little bit unexpected. You're showing a throw right now that that I have in my in my concerns that 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 deep pose or that that the ball to uh, I don't even know which receiver that is. I don't think it's Roman Wilson, but no, um, it's not Roman Wilson, yeah, but it just dies. Wilson. You can see how it's yeah. now he gets lucky because number 12 is beat so badly on they this play. Yeah. But if this ball is out a little bit more towards the numbers, probably not Touchdown. to the numbers, but a little bit more towards the numbers. And then to like the five yard line or the, or the three yard line, it's going to be an easy walk and touchdown instead. And, and roll it back. What real quick. Yeah. If you can, of course, you look at the see, pocket. Yeah. Pockets clean. The pocket's and, as clean as it can get. And that's if he was just more consistent with his deep ball. Oh, I, I think, Honestly, even if he had the trajectory issues over the middle of the field, sure. if he was just more consistent with his deep passing, I would have him over Drake May easily, I think. Okay. Off of the six games I've seen of Drake May, I still have more to watch. I try to watch as much tape as I can on these players. But it's it's I, I don't want a quarterback who is inconsistent throwing deep, even though he has a lot of other traits that I really do value and appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I would. I don't know if it even term it as inconsistent throwing deep. I don't think he's very good right now throwing deep. It's something he has to really work on. He I think that's fair, moments. and I think that's yeah. fair. Too. He has moments. You're right. Like he yeah. he can do it because he's a good because he's a good player. But at the NFL level, man, windows are a lot tighter. You're not gonna have guys right. streaking downfield. Like he has some misses against Maryland, where it's just like, oh my god, man, like what are you yep. doing? Like deep post, wide open, blown coverage, and he puts it like three yards behind the receiver, and the receiver tries to adjust, and the ball ends up going incomplete. And it's just like, dude, we. we you can't have that at the NFL level, right? Like, you no. Can't. Yeah. Especially because of what you, we always talk about on this podcast, Nick, what is it? What we always talk about. We want a quarterback, whoever it is for the giants. We wanted this to be Daniel Jones. We still think, you know, he may have one more chance this next year, but who uses every blade of grass, as you say it, Nick. And that mm-hmm. means 
you have to be a threat as a deep thrower because otherwise those safeties are going to creep up. The defense coordinators are going to play you aggressively from a coverage standpoint. They're going to cut off half the field. They're going to drive on all the underneath throws. There's no yak anymore. The running game is stymied. Just think of the think back to the Eagles divisional round game against the Giants two two years ago when the Giants made the playoffs. That exact game plan and the, the way that the Eagles played the Giants defensively was so le- little regard for the deep halves of the field. That's mm-hmm. what you can't have. You just have no ceiling as a football team when that's the case. So it's something he can work on, obviously. I don't know if what he is now as a deep throw is what he's going to be, Nick. But um, a few more things I wanted to get into uh, from his from from my evaluation. I, th- I said he displays the ability to throw off platform when on the move, specifically to his right, throwing right shoulder, uh, his throwing shoulder. He doesn't need a balanced base or square shoulders to maintain ball placement and velocity when throwing out of structure. I saw plenty of examples of him displaying the ability to change his arm slot and throw from a variety of different arm angles. That seems like a given, but it's not in today's NFL. There's still a lot of over-the-top throwers who really lose their accuracy and ball placement when they're forced to change their arm slot and throw off balance and off platform. I talked about the testing uh, from from an athletic standpoint. He does an excellent job, in my opinion, as a middle-of-the-field passer due to his timing, velocity, and ball placement. Plenty of throws I saw him throw away from the coverage. You showed a couple examples earlier, Nick, where he throws away from the defender. That's another good one right there that you just showed up there. Um, I felt like there was a couple ones in the Indiana game that I had that were just like really NFL level throws. Um, And I think it's important to be able to throw over the middle of the field as a college player, Nick, because of the difference in the rules from the NFL and from college with the hash marks. Like there's not as much space outside the numbers in the NFL. Um, I said he's a tough competitor who will take big hits and get right back up. He's a strong. This one to me is is that I like a lot about McCarthy. So I'm curious what you think on this one. I did see examples, Nick, in in the tape of him just missing a gap blitzes and missing corner blitzes and just seeming unaware after the snap of things that you would hope that he would be able to understand pre snap. But I don't really knock him as much for that because he's so young as a player and is so inexperienced. And I think that's just something he can get better with over time. I do really believe that. But on the flip side of that, Nick, I do feel like he had a strong mental clock in his head when it came to understanding the pressure and the pockets collapsing around him. So while maybe there were some moments where I wish he would have done a better job pre-snap, after the snap, when it's not like a unexpected corner blitz or anything like that, I feel like he did a good job with the, with his mental clock in the pocket. What are your thoughts on that? Because that's big for me. I 100% agree. I think the one game that where I watched it and I was like a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, I don't want to say concern, but it, it yeah. peaked peaked my interest. Right, was Iowa the championship, uh, the Big Ten championship game? I didn't like see he, that one. Yes, he uh, he was getting his ass kicked back there a little bit, and he was holding on to the football a little bit. I think he was sacked okay. five, four or five times in in the game. But overall, I, I do agree, and I think he's creative enough as a runner too to to step up in the pocket when it's necessary, and also roll out when it's necessary. And just to to your point about throwing on the run, I'm glad you noticed that as well because. It's something to me, man. Like there was this play against, I think it was Nebraska, where it was rolling to his left too, right? Yeah. Where he was rolling to his left and he's throwing against his body. He has to stay square to the line of scrimmage. He gets to the sideline and he just freaking fastballs it over or between a couple defenders and puts it right on the one of Roman Wilson for a touchdown. He had a, another play too, where it was rolling to his left or slightly to his left against Rutgers that was, that was similar to that. So that's like one of the reasons why I think the the throwing to the left, it, it is apparent to me that he is a little bit more comfortable to his right, but it's mm-hmm. not inept to his left. So it's not as big of a concern for yeah, me. Although it is it is noteworthy. It is noteworthy. And I'm and I, I that's it's not a point of contention between us, but I wanted to get your take on it because there are times where he does make these really highlight level throws to the left side where you're like, okay, he can do this maybe it's maybe there's a reason why he's not doing it successfully. Maybe it is. He's just not as good rolling against his body. I'm not hundred percent certain, but I just wanted to um put that out there because it, I know it is a yeah. narrative. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I th- it's not that I don't think he can do it and I didn't see moments of him being able to do it. I think it works. It, it it works in the short intermediate levels more so throwing deep to his left. I saw some just like deep patterns, go routes or or any kind of vertically oriented route where the ball kind of sailed out of bounds or just kind of didn't look Mm -hmm. the same coming out of his hand as it did to the right side. Like that's a great throw that you just showed throwing to his left. I do feel like there is more velocity on throws to the right. That's just something I noted. I could be wrong about that. Just something I saw personally. I feel like the ball came out a little crisper to it, throwing to his right. Um, Who knows if that's just something I saw. The games that uh that that he was throwing left and I was like okay that's it's good that really came to my mind I'm not sure if you watched them it was Purdue Michigan State I had Michigan State I didn't watch Purdue 
and UNLV was solid. He, he had like a, two, he had a couple incompletions throwing to his left, I believe. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was like tight coverage. And uh, so those were the three games that I was like, this it's not as big of a deal as as I think uh, some may, may believe. Yeah, I don't think it's a huge deal either. More so on the vertical plane throwing to his left. That that I do believe <laughs> it, it doesn't look good. And the vertical plane is also like just just in general, it's not necessarily it's hard to one. throw to your left. Yeah. Well, well, just in in general, it's just not necessarily something that he does that well. He had one True. 30, 35 yard pass to to Roman Will. It wasn't even like I guess a perfect pass, but it was from the far hash to the left. Because that's one thing I want to like pay attention to those far hash throws to yes. the left. Because a lot of times in the middle of the field or it's a near hash, but he had one thirty five yard strike to Roman Wilson. Uh, and I wouldn't even say it was perfect placement against Purdue that I that I have in my notes that I, that I thought was at least noteworthy because it was a far hash throw. And that's something I do like about like about uh, JJ McCarthy a decent amount. And same with like Michael Penix is they're they're ripping these balls in from the far hash in college. They have the arm strength to right. do that. Like I don't think you're going to be seeing too much uh, coverage where it's disrespectful towards them in the flats on the field side at the NFL level because the hashes are so much more closer together. Yeah, agreed with you on that. And that's the biggest difference between college and NFL. I want to ask you a couple. So I'm, I'm looking into my notes and, and, and to kind of further, and then I can I can ask you about it. So I just, so from what I have in my notes, I felt like there were times, and this was less so when he was throwing to his right versus left, but he did have examples throwing to his right. The Alabama throw I brought up earlier, which I'll ask you about. But when he was throwing to his left, there were moments I had where I wrote down, he kind of over. He had like an overstride into the throw. And these are usually coming from clean pockets and good bases because he had a lot of, he had a decent amount of those at, at Michigan, but I just felt like sometimes he would kind of take a huge hop stride into the throw and it would kind of lead to just like a wonky off target throw. And that the, the, the throw against Alabama, do you know the one I'm talking about where he throws like a, to his right, this one. What's going on, big blue banter listeners. I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. 
Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. That's why we're happy to have AG1 as our partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. Our mental and physical well-being is of the utmost importance. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all need to take that very seriously. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Big Blue Banter podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New York, New Jersey, Arizona, if you will, or hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash banter to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash banter. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment. And before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, include EE system. Yeah, the Alabama throw, Dan, I think I know what you're talking about. It was a little ugly. It sailed on him out of bounds. And that's going to happen sometimes. You will find that on tape with every single quarterback prospect who is yes. in this draft. This play against Minnesota, I think you can see some of the concerns that we have. Now, this is from the far hash, right? And it's not terrible coverage from this Minnesota defender, but the ball just kind of dies. You can see that it yeah. ends up hitting the defender in the back of the calf, I believe. If we Let me see from this angle. The ball just kind of, yeah, ends up hitting the defender in like the back of the calf, I think. like Those are the types of concerns that I have with him. Because I think he has the arm strength, but it's not consistently employed or not effectively employed at a consistent rate. And you have some of these plays throughout his tape where the ball just doesn't get to where it needs to be or it's not optimally placed. And if he has maybe a room or a player like that who will adjust very well and make the catches that are necessary to bail him out, it could certainly raise his ceiling a little bit, but that's not what you want. You want a quarterback right. who can precisely place the football where it needs to be to optimize a wide receiver who is going to create the slightest of separation because you're going up against cornerbacks and some of the top athletes in the entire world. So that's the, this is one plan. I'll try to find others on Twitter to showcase what we're talking about, but this is not uncommon on JJ no. McCarthy's tape. Yeah. And I put this play up because of what you just said. It's not uncommon. I've seen this. And I, so when it comes to the arm talent, arm strength debate, when it comes to JJ McCarthy, I, I do want to get into a few more uh, pros and cons I had, but when it comes to arm talent versus arm, I feel like, and this is something that you could probably speak to Nick, because I don't know if this is a real thing or not, but I honestly feel like there are some quarterbacks who have really good arm strength, velocity, whatever you want to call it in the short intermediate areas of the field and just don't have a deep arm, a deep NFL arm. And I feel like McCarthy might be one of those players. Like the player I comped him to from a frame standpoint, I said, he reminds me of Jimmy Garoppolo just from the frame standpoint, but from the talent, from like the projection standpoint, he reminds me of like rich, what rich Gannon was like, what if he hits his ceiling, it's like what rich Gannon is. And rich Gannon got better at those touch those over the top but he was not a big arm like he will miss that type of throw might have been a miss from rich gannon just like it was from jj mccarthy it's not an easy throw it's far hash it's outside the numbers but drake may doesn't has the nfl arm the caliber arm to make that throw caleb williams has the nfl caliber arm to make that throw i'm personally more inclined to look for quarterbacks who have the arm to make all of the throws and i'm just concerned that he has the arm to make all the throws because if he doesn't he could still be really successful rich gannon was a great quarterback in the nfl there are other examples of like Rich Gannon types that work if they hit their ceiling, um, just great intermediate passers and great short passers and velocity and intermediate and athleticism and ability to create out of structure. Like all the things we just touched on that we really like about McCarthy and I do really like about him. But to me, if he doesn't evolve as a deep passer, I do think it caps his ceiling. 
It certainly caps his ceiling. Absolutely. And uh, look, he's 21 years old. Yeah. It's realistic that he can do it. You know, it, it's certainly realistic that he can do it. He has the pedigree that a lot of these coaching staffs are going to be looking for. Wow. I can't sit here, like I said in the synopsis, and say he's an inaccurate quarterback, but he has inaccurate ball placement. I don't want to say more than you would like. Like, it's not as bad as Drake May from that perspective, but the argument between Drake May and and J.J. McCarthy is always going to come down to the ceiling because Drake May has that arm talent, and it shows up more consistently. It's from, from a standpoint of top-level, deep-passing ball placement, changing up trajectory. That's where Drake May beats out J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy, overall, I would say, is a more accurate quarterback, though, than Drake May, because Drake May, for whatever reason, skips footballs into his wide receiver's feet way too commonly. And it's probably because he has all of these footwork issues. Like right. I said, I'm six games in, and I was kind of shocked by how bad Drake May's feet are and how how inaccurate he is on seemingly these, these layup type of throws. But then you see Drake May rip a 50-yard post between two safeties converging, and you're like, oh. That's what I love to see. And that's not something that you necessarily see too frequently from a player like J.J. McCarthy, who, who is also not, I would say, the most precise quarterback in the draft class. No, or a lot of quarterbacks that enter in the NFL. Probably, you don't see a lot of, like, did you watch the Georgia Tech game yet with Drake May? I have not, no. Okay, check out the Georgia Tech game next or whatever, at some point, because um, it was closer to me resembling what he looked like in 2022, which he was a better quarterback in 2022. Some people may knock that, but I personally just have decided not to, when you lose 180 targets or multiple offensive linemen and a coordinator, I just, to me, that's context that should be included. And I do think when it comes to may versus McCarthy, may and Williams, I'll put him in that too, versus McCarthy, Penix, Bo Nix. It it's night and day. What these guys were working with from a team standpoint, it's not even really yes. remotely close Absolutely. may and us USC and UNC had like 125th ranked defenses. Michigan was a great defense. Washington was a great defense. Oregon was a great defense. O lines, not even close receivers, not even close. So it's something to consider and, and it makes the projection cloudier. I wish I had a chance to ask Matt Wallman about that. I want to see his take about that when it came to Penix first may like, do you, how much do you factor in the sporting casts? But it's something that you just have to kind of guess on and project on a couple of things I wanted to talk about i said that he showed notable improvement and you brought this up before from 2022 to 2023 specifically for me like where this is so evident nick is if you watch the 2022 ohio state game versus the 2023 ohio state game i felt like the difference it was a quarter it was night and day with mccarthy from 2022 to 23 he had that one play against ohio state that is a great microcosm of the creativity that i've keep bringing up throughout this podcast where he was rolling to his right and he was about to go out of bounds and he threw, it wasn't across his body because it was to the sideline, but it was this awkward throw that somehow went right into the chest. It wasn't Roman Wilson of one of his receivers right before the defensive back got there. And he kind of has a lot of those types of throws, not just from a creativity standpoint, but like just beating the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the closing window being, being just shut right like if if there is just a, a throwing window that is a jar just slightly a jar this dude has the zip to to fit the football into that throwing window and that is another aspect of his game that i certainly appreciate and i think it it's going to be quicker at the nfl level like they're not going to stay open as long but that is still a translatable trait it is a translatable trait and you know i had other other examples of jj mccarthy that I, that i like from my notes i was looking at both the indiana game and the the minnesota game notes I think, and then we talked about this a little bit with Jaden Daniels, but if you're in a 17, 13 type game and you're like a giants 2022 20, version of what their roster is, and you need to win these games by, you know, one score defensive first game ball control type of type of style, which might be what the giants are for the foreseeable future. We don't know. They would need a dynamic quarterback to kind of get them out of that structure. But if you're in that structure, I do think JJ McCarthy has the improv improv improvisational ability to make big plays at alter gains. I've seen him get out of structure, get out of pocket and make throws down the field to a broken, uh, you know, on a broken play to a receiver who broke free of the coverage for big gains, 65 yard touchdowns that change and alter the trajectory of the game. That to me is really important. And I think I've seen that on his tape. I just from some other notes from the Indiana, I said that um, there was a good example. I thought of him showing uh, the ability to have timing and ball placement on back shoulder throws versus Indiana, which I think is, is a good next level thing. I thought he did a good job of a Patrick Mahomes impression at one point where he changed his arm slot, does a lot of good jobs, of the, uh, a lot of good examples of him changing his arm slot, in my opinion, trajectory on the football. I felt like he had um, that, that, not, that play, not trajectory by the way, on the football. Right. Not trajectory on the football, his yeah. arm slot, though. But yeah, but let me let me just let me try to rephrase that. Um, not trajectory on the football as far as like touch goes, but 
on the plays I'm, where I'm, what I'm discussing most here with like the Patrick Mahomes impression would be like on the plays around the line of scrimmage where sometimes there's a defender who's like in your face and it's like going to be a quick throw. And I see a lot of quarterbacks make the mistake in the NFL and the college level of just continuing to maintain basically an over the top motion. I thought he does, it showed some some moments of him getting rid of the football and like a sidearm three force type of thing to get it away from that. Oh, yeah. Player. Changing the arm slot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he does slot, that a yeah. lot. I guess arm slot, not trajectory. Yes. That's what I meant. That's more of what I meant to say. Or that is what I meant to say. Um, I thought that he had better athleticism than people realize. We talked about that earlier. There was an example of a late fourth quarter run against Indiana that I put uh, in my notes. Showed great contact <laughs> balance, the ability to absorb the hit as a runner. Um, the other thing I thought was from the Minnesota game. That was the one where I saw a, re a couple really good NFL throws as well. There was a deep dig he ran that that he ripped in there, and I thought it was a really good throw. So, again, I know he's one of the more polarizing prospects in this class, Nick, but I think I'm more along the lines of, of, of where you are. I was definitely more impressed than I thought I would be from watching his tape, and I liked him more than I thought I would be, though I do have reservations about his ability to, to throw the ball, football down the field, and that that's something to me. Same here. Same here. Look, I don't think he's boom bust. I think he can be a functional starter even in year one. Uh, I just think there there is a bit of a ceiling cap because of all of the limitations that we discussed. But I'm right there with you, man. He definitely somebody when when I went into his tape, I didn't expect to to appreciate his skill set as much as I ended up appreciating it based on stupid pre-draft narratives. That's why you got to watch the tape, buddy. Yeah. I have a few advanced stats we can go over real quick um, just to give a kind of idea of where of where he stacks up against the rest of the class. Um, and these are a, a courtesy of Dave Richard of, of CBSSports.com. When pressured over 113 dropbacks last year, Nick McCarthy attempted 82 passes and completed 63.4% of them with just 12.2% off target rate for 9.5 yards per attempt on an 11.4 average depth of target. That's also something I like about his game, by the way, Nick, his average depth of target is pretty good. Now is part of that. Cause he runs a pro style offense. I'm sure like those are where the stats get a little wonky, Nick, right? Because he doesn't have as many of these like quick screens and like RPO type stuff and all this line of scrimmage shit that will kind of drag down his a dot, but it's still impressive on the pressure drop back to have that. And this led all the big five quarterbacks in completion rate, as well as uh, tied for the best off target rate. The lowest off target rate is the better way to describe that. And the second best yards per attempt when pressured behind just Jaden Daniels. Um, his a dot was only 0.1 behind Daniels and 0.7 behind Penix for the highest average at the target when pressured. Only Bo Nix had a higher completion rate when pressured, but his a dot was just 7.5 yards. So to me, I'll take the 11.4 average of the target over the seven, five, even if he's slightly higher Bo Nix in his two seasons as a starter, Nick McCarthy threw 13.8% of his targets to running backs, 57.8 to receivers, 24.9 to tight ends among the big five in this class. And that's Caleb Williams, JJ McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Drake may Michael Penix McCarthy was top in completion rate. Just a little bit ahead of Jaden Daniels had the lowest off target rate, 9.3% ninth lowest among all qualifiers and the lowest intercept, or sorry, the 10th lowest interception rate at 1.2%. He was third in touchdown rate and yards per attempt, 9.0 and 6.63% for the touchdown rate. Second to last in average at the target uh, overall, I guess this was. And attempts of 15 plus air yards, he had 26.2, which was the second lowest rate for the air yard passage. Um, let's see what else we got here. He had 10 throws in 2022 and three in 2023 that were 40 plus air yards. So just 13 attempts, three touch 50 or more air yards. Another five were between 45 and 49. He went just six of 13 for 323 yards on those 13 attempts. So this touches a little bit on what we discussed, Nick, with the vertical issues. Um, quick throws, he got the ball out in 2.5 seconds or less. And when he did, 74.9% completion rate, 7.3 yards per attempt there. And this was. Um, no better than third in the category, except interception rate. Um, when he had time, McCarthy completed 69.3% of his throws for an 11.0 yards per attempt. So pretty good stuff when he did have time there. Um, excluding sacks, McCarthy had 61 carries for 237 yards and three touchdowns on the ground. Ground avoided tackle rate of 29.5% was the second highest among all big five quarterbacks, which has, you know, some athletic quarterbacks in the class, Jaden Daniels, Drake may, um, and kind of goes to show that he is a little bit more athletic than people realize. Um, and so those are some of the advanced stats on JJ McCarthy. All right, let's get into like the, the serious part of this conversation, sure. right? JJ McCarthy, New York giants. Make the argument, the York Giants might need a quarterback for the long term. J.J. McCarthy is a solid quarterback prospect. 
we already discussed our, our reservations with the ceiling. That's out there, and it's hard to ignore. But let's say the Giants make the selection at six. J.J. McCarthy on draft day. How is Dan Schneier feeling? Oh, if they make the selection at six, that means they don't trade up. He's just on the board and they take him. I will be feeling okay about it. That's probably my feel on it. I will be trusting in Dable and Shane. I'll be excited about the fact that we have a new quarterback in here. I'm sorry to say that to those who that somehow offends, but I am looking for an upgrade at quarterback. I would assume a lot of you are. I know Nick is as well. Most most fans are, but I know it offends some, but I, I would be excited about the possibility of maybe upgrading quarterback. It's a possibility. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but it would be interesting to have another talented quarterback prospect in the quarterback room. So would it be my favorite thing? I'm not so sure. I can I can probably get to that, but let me just, you know, reverse this on you. Where How would you feel if that was the case? I'm right there with you. I, okay. I wouldn't necessarily be like over the moon excited. Like this guy is definitely going to hit, but there are enough tools here to work with, but there are also enough concerns to have me say, Dable, you better figure that out. You better figure right. that out. Okay. You better stabilize the deep passing. You better coach this kid up because there are some things that iron out, but I would be, I would be uh, cautiously optimistic about it. You got a new, for everything that you said, you got a new guy in the building right? and a guy who has a proven track record winning. It might not be beautiful right off the bat, but I think it's, uh, there's enough traits to get excited about. And there this, are, this there regime are. would definitely be, you know, saying this, this is a flag plant thing. Like if this doesn't work out, you're gone. Oh, yeah. Both the general manager and the head coach. So they would have to really be certain that this is their guy. So I'd be cautiously optimistic. Yeah. And that's a great point. They're not going to just take a guy to take a guy because that's not going to work out for them for their long-term, you know, job security. But I will say this, I would be cautiously optimistic, but I would also have some concerns about something you mentioned earlier that just stuck out to me, Nick, about how he would fit Brian Dable's offense of what we saw in 2022, just because I don't personally want that to be the long-term offense for the Giants. I know that's not what you're saying, but, and he might be able to do a better version of that or whatever, or, you know, that's, that's, that. that's yeah. more so like you, you brought up his data. Look, JJ McCarthy, at least will let it rip. Right. That's my problem with Daniel Jones. Right. Daniel Jones doesn't. He's hesitant. True. He's a little bit late to see when it's open. And by the time he sees it, it's not open anymore. Right. JJ can be late sometimes, but it it's not as big of a problem as it was, in my opinion, from Daniel Jones. And I know it's hard to kind of compare those two because Daniel Jones playing in the NFL. Right. JJ McCarthy's playing in the Big Ten. Right. But True. JJ McCarthy did let it rip. It's just when he did let it rip, I didn't really love the the outcome of him letting it rip. And that's what needs to be uh, fixed and ironed out. But I want somebody who has that mentality, at least. Right. I want somebody who is going to threaten that defense. So defensive coordinators aren't being like, yo, this guy, let's just you know play top down on all these guys. They ain't going to do anything. We saw that last season with San Francisco, Seattle. Some of that is because of the offensive line. But I've also watched enough Daniel Jones to know that this has been something that has plagued him throughout his professional career. And his college career as well. If you go back to the Duke tape, um, where you know you, you you could check out the numbers yourself on on his Duke stats. But as far as that question goes, Nick, I almost wonder, and I'll throw it to you because I think with Daniel Jones, part of the issue is what you just said. He he maybe doesn't process it fast enough to throw it. Now, as far as the deep ball goes, they have very different profiles. Daniel Bones is a, Jones is a touch thrower on the deep half. He throws a touch. I think both of them sometimes struggle to lead the receiver into space on the deep half and to throw into space and throw ahead of the receiver. I think a lot of the ball for Jones, he has good touch, but sometimes as you saw with Jalen Hyatt game against Vegas and plenty of other examples, the ball might hang up there a little bit. JJ to me is different though. He doesn't struggle with touch on the deep half. He struggles with with the, well, he struggles with touch on deep half, but it's not like he's putting too much touch. He's putting no touch on his deep throws. So yeah, like, Maybe Jones is a better deep, Jones is like definitely, oh, a, better definitely deep a better ball deep thrower ball than thrower. JJ. Yeah, there's not even a question if you look at the if you look at the tape. Jones is a much better deep ball thrower. But maybe what you're saying is JJ will see it and throw it. He's just not, you know, accurately putting it in the right spot. But my question for you would be like, you may not have the answer to this. We may, I not may you might not have the answer to this. Is that something that can be corrected? Is was was the question. You know, that that's something we're gonna have a quarterback on. A, a former quarterback and a quarter current quarterback coach who I just spoke with today, and he's gonna join the show at some point. We 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 were supposed to have him on a couple weeks ago, but he had some issues um and, and we just couldn't connect. But I'm gonna ask him that question, Nick, about JJ specifically. Like, how does that work? Like, can you improve that? And is it a mechanics thing? Is it if, if it's a mechanics thing, I feel like it can be fixed. 
If it's not a mechanics thing, that's when I start to get concerned because regardless of the situation, Nick, whether it's Jones or JJ, whether it's Jones having the ability to throw deep, but just not attempting it a lot or JJ attempting it, but not throwing it well, either way, the end result is you're not connecting passes in the deep half and the defenses know this and they're adjusting to it on tape and they're putting everything close and you have no chance to have a high ceiling offense. That's the ultimate reality of if you can't connect on passes in the deep half, whether it's you don't see it or, you, or you're missing it. So that has to be, that's something that the Giants would have to feel very confident they could fix. Brian Dable, look, that's not necessarily the issue he had to fix up in Buffalo, but he did fix right. a quarterback prospect who had a lot of other issues, similar issues True. that Drake May seems to yes. have with just like, not being able to make the layup, but being able to hit the home run, right? right. Just to bring three sports into this. No, it's true though. They, they, Josh Allen's issues are way similar to what Drake May has. It's why some people like, you know, feel like the day will Drake May connection makes sense based on that. But I would wonder, and I will ask this quarterback coach if JJ's issues are correctable from from yeah. a coaching standpoint, because that's something that's important to me. Because you know, we have to be able. He has to be able to do that. If we go through quarterbacks who have come into the NFL draft, and I haven't evaluated every quarterback class coming in, okay. but I'm sure there have been quarterbacks in the past that didn't necessarily have the most precise deep ball in college, but came to the NFL and wildly improved their accuracy. We know accuracy can be improved. We yes. saw that with Josh Allen. It's just the deep accuracy and the touch and what JJ's issues are, can that be improved? I don't necessarily have the answer. I'd like to think that yeah. it could be. I, I do, especially for a very coachable kid, but I'd rather uh, defer to to someone who is an expert on that. Me too. And we'll, we'll get those answers. Now, the next question would be, how would Nick Filato feel? I'll bring it back to what you said. If the Giants trade up to three or four to select JJ McCarthy. See, I'm typically one of those individuals who says, if you identify a quarterback to be your guy, go up and get that individual. I don't know if JJ McCarthy has that ceiling though, to where I would be ecstatic about that. Right. Like I was, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm cautiously optimistic at six, but now we're trading future assets could be a future two, maybe even a future maybe one, a one, depending that I'm probably going to be upset about it. I think I'm always going to be upset if the giants have to trade a future one, even if it's for freaking Tom Brady, you know, just yeah. because I, I love covering the draft that, and I like having that first round pick and selfish for selfish reasons. But uh, in all seriousness, yeah, that wouldn't overly excite me. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't be too thrilled either if the Giants are trading assets to move up for JJ McCarthy. I just, but it, it's a big like trust, like it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things where I, I would not be thrilled, but it is like, all right, trust the process. You guys better figure this out. Yeah. I, if I had to make a prediction right now, listening to all the smoke that I've heard, I would say the most likely scenario that I would pick, gun to the head, is that the Vikings are not as into McCarthy as they've been they've been said to be, and they really want Drake May. That the Patriots will take Drake May at three, and the Giants that the draft will go by, and the Giants will take JJ McCarthy at six. That's my gut feel for how this is going to go down in a couple weeks from now. I don't know if that's right. It's just from things I've heard, and and just my gut feel overall for what I've heard about how the Giants feel about McCarthy. Now. I could be wrong. The Vikings could trade up to four to take McCarthy. The Vikings trade up to five to take McCarthy. Either one is in front of the Giants or the Patriots could take McCarthy or the Washington football team could take McCarthy. And those are things that have been speculated on and reported. We talked about it at the top of the show, Nick, but I just get this gut feeling that McCarthy will be the sixth overall pick to the Giants in this draft. So it's going to be interesting to see. I I'm with you though. I don't want them to trade up for McCarthy. Now, would you prefer McCarthy at six or neighbors at six? Mm, I think neighbors. I think I'm, I'm more too, so in, in the in the wide receiver camp. I, if I were to tell you what I think is going to happen, I think it's going to be a yeah, What do you think? If you had to get right now, I think it's a Dunes at six. Dunes at six. Okay, possible trade down, but that's like more of a bold. I don't even know. If bold is probably the right way to phrase that, but more of an outside chance. It's like, oh crap, they actually did trade down. Now they can really fill some of the other holes that they have. But if I had a gun in my head, I would probably say Odunze. But if Neighbors is on the board and Neighbors checks out from a um, from a character standpoint, because I know there were some things in his past, I think a gun charge. Not, there's no way I'm going to know like what exactly that we means, don't know right? About that yeah, I have no idea, but. I, I would say neighbors. I'm not as in love, I think, with this draft classes or this quarterback draft classes as others. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think it's good. I think there's there's possible starters in it, which is better than a lot of the other classes in recent memory. I mean, right. it wasn't long ago where it was Kenny Pickett and, and Malik Willis, but I don't know if this is going to be a lot of class. Sorry, yeah. 
no, I just don't know how high a lot of like I think the ceiling of Caleb, like Caleb is Caleb. And then I think Drake May has a high ceiling. And McCarthy, I think, can be functional. And Jane Daniels, I think Jane Daniels has a high ceiling. I just don't know if he'll ever reach that. And I do have my concerns about Jane Daniels, specifically targeting the middle of the field, which is not an issue for Drake May and not an issue for JJ McCarthy. And then also his frame and his playing style. Now his frame isn't too different from JJ McCarthy. Like they're both sub 220, but JJ is so much better at avoiding contact. Whereas Jane Daniels isn't Drake right. May. He's like what? 225, 230. He also doesn't do a great job no. avoiding contact. He's man. like a Josh always... Allen out there when it comes to the contact. He, he is man. He, he is. Bumper I feel like Josh, I feel like Josh is bigger. And that could be wrong. He is think, bigger, yeah. Yeah. He's like, what, six, five? Like but I don't know if he was, I don't know if he was bigger. He was definitely a, an inch taller. I don't know if he was definitely bigger frame wise coming out. I kind of want to find this out to, to see because I know he, he looks bigger now for sure, mm. Josh Allen. Yeah. But I'm curious what he was coming out. So he was pretty big coming out, but he's, he's, was 237 coming out. Let's see That's what Drake huge. May was. That is huge coming out. And you could see it when you watch him. Let's see what Drake May is coming out. Drake May is 223. So there is definitely a difference there. There's like a 15 pound difference. I, I was yeah. watching Drake May's, who was it? Yeah, I think it was in the Minnesota game where he, on like the first drive, he got nailed over the middle of the field and then he was running towards the sideline, didn't get down, didn't go out of bounds and just got his cold clocked. And I was like, Bro, he plays a doing? lot of hero ball there, which is something I'm sure that that's, you know, being discussed by some scouts and NFL teams as far as do we like that? Do we not like that? Uh, as far as your, your overall take, just to get on some 30,000 foot view stuff with a quarterback class. I probably tend to agree with you though. I do think Caleb Williams is one of the best prospects I've seen and will be for the next five, four or five years. I think there's a lot of just bad classes, like even like a couple classes ago, for example, like to me, if you want to call Trey Lance similar to Drake may from a developmental standpoint, a tool standpoint, I don't even think I was watching anywhere close to the same quarterback. When I watched Trey Lance first, first Drake may to me, Drake may is not even close to like he, People call him a project, but there's a different level of project between like a Drake May and a Trey Lance in my mind. And I don't even really find it that close uh, at all to begin with. And so you look, you look at some of those classes. Yeah, go ahead. I also, I don't think I was as high on on that draft class as, as, as a other lot people of other people were, yeah. are too. Because I wasn't a big Zach Wilson guy. I wasn't a big right. Justin Fields guy. Trey Lance, I was like, it's hard to evaluate because he had the COVID year. He played, mm -hmm. he played like 19 games. So that was developmental just yeah. in that. And then uh, I liked Trevor Lawrence. Right. And then Mac Jones, I was like, smart, he's surrounded at Alabama, doesn't really have a strong arm. So I wasn't, a, so I didn't really love that class as much as other analysts did. Maybe I'm tough grade, grading on just like quarterbacks specifically, but I'm trying to think of like the last class where I was like, yeah, there's, there's dudes here. Like yeah, multiple I'm, dudes. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that too. I'm also tough on grading quarterbacks. Like for me, I need to see a ceiling from an arm. You're very point. tough on yeah. grading quarterbacks. Yeah, because I, I, I want to respect that. Yeah, and I, I don't. That. I don't want a top fifteen quarterback because where does that get you? Like it gets you nowhere. It gets you to winning some games and competing for div not division. It gets you competing for wild card on a consistent basis, like the Vikings have been. Like even like the crazy thing, dude, is like how tall. Like Kirk Cousins is that viewed as like a success story or is it viewed as like you don't like. The Vikings that never won. should be that should be an absolute grand slam story, in my opinion. And I think we don't just from the third here. round capital you invested, yes. but I'm not saying from that yes. perspective, I'm saying take away the draft capital, forget it. Now the yeah. Vikings sign him for a million dollars on the second contract, okay. millions of dollars on the second contract. When you get to that second contract, though, he doesn't win anything ever, and you're never winning divisions except for like one year, and you're never competing even in the divisional rounds, basically, let alone the conference championship or the Super Bowl. And they built a lot around him. They built different teams. They, they added all the cat. They front loaded all their cap. They tried everything they could there. But like, if that, like, that's the problem I have with like, I with not with like getting excited about a non ceiling quarterback. I still think Kirk cousins is plenty good enough to win a super bowl. You would think, but it just, doesn't I, I just to happen. Do, look, he was, <laughs> on, he was on a Washington team that was ran by your brother and it was absolutely terrible. Related. <laughs> yeah, I know. People are going to like you and the Nickelodeon guy, right? I don't even remember that. <laughs> but uh, he was like, he wasn't in a great situation in Washington. He ends up leveraging a great uh, financial reality and getting a fully guaranteed contract to go to Minnesota. And he had some good teams in Minnesota. 
but it didn't necessarily manifest. And then his last year in Minnesota, before he tore his Achilles, when he was in the playoffs and he lost to the Giants, his defense was historically bad. Yeah. So He's I don't been, know. There's man. been circumstances for sure. And I think both you and I agree that when we watch the tape of these quarterbacks, at the NFL level, he's so much better than the consensus believes in him. And I know you agree that because we've talked about of it. Course, he makes throws yeah. that none of these quarterbacks make from an anticipation standpoint, from a using the entire every inch of the field standpoint. He does do all those things. But then at the same time, it's like somehow, some way, the most success that Vikings franchise had was your case. Keenum was their quarterback. And it's just weird. It's just odd to me that he does never make point. any runs and never wins. But it's also like the Dak Prescott thing. We both think his tape is better than the fan consensus believes on Prescott too, but they never compete and win anything real either. Yeah. So it just, it's so hard. That ceiling is so hard to reach a quarterback. And maybe it's just me being too obsessed with finding it. And you never just, you just accept the fact that like, maybe you just have to pay these types of guys, 45 million, 50 million, and just hope to build a good team around them and like lock into a Super Bowl run one time. But like, I don't know, man, I, I would rather just keep looking for the, for the Josh Allen Mahomes Stroud, if he's the next one type of guy, because when you get there, now you're competing for divisions, not wild cards. And you're competing for Super Bowls, not divisional round playoff games. And it just seems to me to be a much more fun way to, or much a way that I want the Giants to be, even if that, if that means losing on the gamble a lot, because you're going to lose. You're certainly going to lose on the gamble. Yeah. And there have been plenty of teams who have. But yeah, overall, just to summarize, J.J. McCarthy, look, if the Giants select him at six, I'm not going to be upset, kicking and screaming. I'll be cautiously optimistic and, and we'll roll with yeah. it. And there's going to be some excitement there as well. To put it in terms related to this class, Nick, and I'm, I don't know if you agree with this. I, I'm, I would think you don't because I'm probably lower on him than it says. I'm trying to warm up to him. I'm going to rewatch a bunch of him, but there's just factors in his profile that I don't know if the tape's going to change for my position uh, from a projection standpoint. If they take JJ McCarthy at six, I'll be cautiously optimistic. If they take Michael Penix at six, dude. I'm just going to be, it's nah, them. So. It would never happen, but like that's to me is like, now you're taking a 24 year old dude with an injury, major injury history. You're really taking a chance here and it and requires a shit ton of projection as far as like what he did at college versus what he's going to see at the NFL. So this could be a Joe Burrow, Jamar chase situation though, with the giants where with, with going panics and Odunze or something. Yes. I, yeah, I wouldn't be. be, I wouldn't be shocked. If the giants select Odunze at six and then trade back up into the first round to get P Michael Penix jr. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in love with that. I don't that. even think he's going to go in the first. I don't think he even needs to. He might not. He might not. He might just be sitting there for the Giants because there are right. a lot of reasons to suggest Michael Penix Jr. will not. The fact that he is older, the fact that he has that injury issue, the fact that yeah. he has, doesn't have a huge track record or a great track record of throwing under pressure, although I will credit him, he does a good job when pressure is around him to not take the sack. So you're not taking the negative plays, right? right. And that is a high. A he high throws bounds. That's what Wallman said. Yeah, exactly. It's a high processing trait that the quarterback has. He has a natural feel, but he's also been in college longer than Van Wilder at this right. point. Right. And that's the other thing. Like with him and Knicks, it's like, how much do we factor in how many snaps they've had? Is that a good thing? It might be a good thing, though. As far as like who's ready, Penix might be ready, more ready right now than McCarthy or Drake May, which is crazy to think about. But it's like, are you banking on who's going to help you in 2024 or who's going to help you in 2027 and 2026? Right. Like that yeah. should we know that's what NFL teams do. They don't look for the now. They look for the future, especially at the quarterback position. So unless the team is like very yeah. well built up and it's like we Vikings, can get for example. Yeah. I don't think the Vikings are well built up. I think they got a lot of work on defense that they need. To oh, do. yeah, you're right. They just have they a good offense, do. though. I do think Brian Flores like hides like most of their defense. He does. It's crazy how good of a coordinator he is. I'll say this with the yeah. I think he's a very he's a he's a different coordinator. Similar. Yeah, maybe to he's just Martin different. Dale. There were times of last year where everyone was saying something similar to that. And then I would watch the Vikings. I'm like, dude, he's getting freaking torched. Or I'd be going like I would have a fantasy receiver going up yeah. against his defense. And the guy would go off for like 11 and 150. And I'm like, stop him. Stop well, him. That can happen when you're just sending guys every exactly. single play and playing press man the entire time. Like Exactly. You need the cornerbacks to, to hold up on a system like that. You as do. Giant I feel like when it works horribly, it looks like that. It looks so bad. But then there's also just I feel like games where the quarterback is just totally totally overwhelmed and there's no solution based on the offensive line quarterback combination. And maybe somebody like Brian Flores is just banking on the idea that there's so many bad quarterback O-line combinations in the NFL that he can, he can, he can like hit this 75% of the time. This, this plan works or something like that. I don't know. It's interesting to think about, but anyway, back to the giants and JJ McCarthy. I think we both agree. We probably don't want them to trade up for this quarterback. We both agree at six. We'd be interested in it. I don't think it's either of our preference over neighbors or a Dunze or Dunze, I should say. Um, 
Now, here's the question. Oh, we will get into some other questions now, later as far as comparing the quarterbacks, but we don't need to do that right now because we haven't fully evaluated them all. But I think we cover most with McCarthy. Anything else we missed here? No, man. I think uh, that's good. If anybody wants to go read my detailed uh, um, scouting report on them, go to um, the Giants. I think type Giants Country into Google. I think they changed their name, but it's the former SI affiliate, formerly known as Giants Country, Patricia Chana's site, and the and the uh, scouting report should be up there shortly. Yeah, and same thing goes for me. If you want to see my report of McCarthy, you can find it on CBSSports.com. I have like six, seven film clips cut up that I put in there. Strengths, concerns, fantasy football fits, if you like that. Dynasty outlook, if you like that. And just some notes on his background that I that I found when researching him, uh, kind of who he is as a player. And I do definitely like that hockey background, by the way, Nick. I want to end on that because it's pretty cool that he's a tough, and you could see he's a tough, tough SOB out there, McCarthy. Absolutely, man. You yep. know me, I'm, I'm always going to love yeah, a hockey you're a big player. hockey guy. Yep. Oh, yeah, dude. All right. That is all the time we have for today on the Big Blue Banter podcast. Keep it locked and loaded. More interviews coming, more player profiles. We're going to do a mailbag soon. We, so if you have any questions uh, and you didn't see the Twitter tweet, find us on Twitter and send us your question for the mailbag. You can DM Nick or I, and we'll read it on the show and answer it. We're also going to do a live show soon. We haven't decided exactly when, but that's coming up potentially very soon. So be on the lookout for that. Have a great rest of your night or weekend, and we'll talk to you soon.